Johnny Cash, outlaw of country music. If you know much about his life, you know that indeed he was a bona fide outlaw. Uh, Johnny Cash admittedly was someone who struggled with addiction, alcohol, drugs. Uh, they say that Johnny Cash liked to get hopped up on pills and go for ride, uh, rides in his Jeep, uh, legend says. And Johnny Cash was always in trouble, uh, or seemed to be, especially in the 60s. As a matter of fact, in the late 60s, he was famously arrested in El Paso, Texas. He had just driven into Juarez, Mexico to score a thousand amphetamine pills, and they busted him, and he got thrown in jail, famously wrote about it. But he was indeed an outlaw. He was a guy who liked to get in trouble, famous, notorious for smashing up hotel rooms, for getting busted with drugs and driving drunk and women in trouble, and it kind of followed Johnny Cash around. In 1969, though, someone reached out to Johnny Cash, and it was someone that would shock most of you in this room. I came across this. I was surprised. I didn't know the story. And honestly, the individual that reached out to him, it shocked those around this individual. Many people around this person said, you know, I don't know if you should be associating with Johnny Cash. He's bad news. You know, he's in trouble all the time. Might not be good for your image or might not be good for your look. But this individual reached out to Johnny Cash and set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Who is this man that sought to spend some time with Johnny Cash? His picture's on the screen. The right Reverend Billy Graham, right? Saint Billy reached out to Johnny Cash, set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting, and Johnny Cash said this, he said, I was curious about why Billy had come to see me. I had only recently gotten off drugs. And Johnny said, we had a big meal. We sat around and we talked a long time and I kept waiting for him to say what he came to see me about. But that first night, we simply ate and talked about music. How do you begin to reach outlaws how do you begin to reach outcasts? Outlaws and outcasts. How do you seek to love people who are far away from God? How many of you in this, in this room, by a show of hands, have someone in your life around you that's far away from God? Would you put your hand up, please? Most of us can relate to this. How do we seek to have conversations that count with outlaws an outcast. I want you to open up your Bible to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, if you have your Bible, go ahead and flip there. If you don't, the text will be on the screen. John chapter 4, verses 3 through 26. A very famous chunk of Scripture. Most of you know it. It's Jesus and the woman at the well. It's 23 verses. I want to read it to you in its entirety. I know it's a lot, so hang with me, bear with me, but... I want you to see and I want you to listen to, especially as we read this, the way this conversation unfolds. There are some great, great practical principles in this text. And so John chapter 4, verses 3 through 26, let's read it together. It says this, He left Judea and went away again into Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. Once again, look at that word. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was setting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour, about noon. Verse 7, there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, how is that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? Verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. 
She said to him, sir, nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give shall never thirst. But the water that I give will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Verse 15, listen to this. The woman said to her, sir, give me this water so I'll not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw. He said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And he said to her, you have correctly said I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worship in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, all, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Listen to this. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming. He was called the Christ. When that one comes, when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Last verse. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you, am he. Let's pray. Father, teach us from your word today. Teach us how to reach, how to love, how to walk beside outlaws and outcasts. Help me to get out of the way. It's your truth. Move in a powerful way. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. That's the longest conversation between Jesus and one person in all of Scripture. You won't find a conversation with any of his disciples, with John, with Peter, with anyone longer than he had with the woman at the well. It's the longest conversation that he ever had that we know about and read about. What's in there that's so practical and important for us today? I believe it's a clear laid out way to have a conversation with someone that makes a difference. How to have a conversation with someone who is, once again, an outlaw or an outcast. What's the first thing you have to do, number one? Number one, allow ordinary opportunities to be divine appointments. Allow ordinary opportunities to be divine appointments. That verse four, where it says he had to go through Samaria. That's not the easiest route to go. And it says he had to go. It's not out of convenience that he had to go. There are two great reasons why Jesus didn't have to go through Samaria. Hills and hatred. Hills and hatred. If you know much about that part of the country, it was a massive change in elevation to go through Samaria. He was going back to Galilee. He was going back to Galilee. There's multiple routes to go. And oh, by the way, the one you didn't take was through Samaria because it was hilly. And in those days, as you know, you had to walk. Hills, hatred. Jews and Samaritans did not mix. They didn't get along. As a matter of fact, they hated each other. And this had been going on for centuries at this point. Ever since the Babylonian captivity, Jews saw the Samaritans as, quite frankly, half-breeds, and they wanted nothing to do with them. And so when it says he had to go, it wasn't out of convenience that he had to go. It was because God had an appointment for Jesus at the well with a woman who was an outcast. That's why he had to go. Can I tell you something today? God wants to use you to do powerful things in the lives 
of those around you. But you have to be available. It's that simple. You have to be available. And oh, by the way, it's not always going to be convenient, but can I give you some encouragement? You don't have to go overseas. You don't have to be in a volunteer position. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be ordained. You don't even have to know a lot about who God is other than be a believer in him and make yourself available. And he will use you to impact the lives of those around you. He wants to use you to reach outlaws and outcasts. And oh, by the way, duties and obligations often lead to divine encounters and opportunities. If you're a doctor, if you're a janitor, if you're a teacher, a mechanic, a CPA, a lawyer, it doesn't matter. God wants to use you right where you are to reach people around you. Allow ordinary opportunities to be divine appointments. The second thing we see in this text is you've gotta be willing to break down barriers and build bridges. Break down barriers and build bridges. When we meet people, most often time where we start are the things that we don't have in common, the differences we have. When we meet someone for the first time, what do we do? We look at them and we say, I don't dress like that, or we don't hang out with the same people, or man, they, don't, they didn't go to the type of school I went to, or they live in the other part of town, or man, there's a lot of tattoos. We begin to identify all the things that we don't have in common. What is that? Those are all barriers. What did Jesus do in this text? He began to break down the barriers. What were those barriers? Oh, by the way, what were the barriers? First and foremost, and simple, there was a racial and religious barrier. Once again, Jews and Samaritans did not mix. They didn't spend time together. They didn't want to be around each other. Jesus knew that. He had experienced that. The woman knew that. When she came walking up, you can see, you can hear when you read the text, she's shocked. <laughs> Why are you asking me for a drink? I'm a Samaritan. But Jesus broke down the barrier of race and religion. The second barrier he broke down was a gender barrier. Once again, she was a woman. And in those days, women didn't participate in the worship in, uh, in synagogue. They didn't get to attend. They were kind of restricted to a spectator role. They were not to touch the scriptures. A man was not to talk to a woman much in public, even his wife. There were all types of barriers between men and women, but what does Jesus do? He sets this beautiful example of pushing back discrimination and pushing back gender barriers to do what? to have a conversation that counts with someone. What's the third barrier in the conversation? It's the most obvious, the moral barrier. Racial, religious, gender, and then there's a moral barrier. What was she caught up in? She was caught up in sin, sexual sin, to be frank. Bring your husband, I don't have a husband. I know, you've had five. And the one you're with right now is not your husband. I think though when Jesus walked up and he saw her and he looked into her eyes, he saw the shame, he saw the guilt, he saw the hurt, the pain, the brokenness, the emptiness. And what did he do? Pushed on through all that and engaged her face to face, one on one and have a conversation with her, a moral barrier. Look at the bridges. Let me point them out real quick. Look at the bridges that Jesus begins to build in the conversation. Look at verses seven through nine. The first bridge we see, verses seven through nine, is step outside of stereotypes. If you want to reach outlaws and outcasts, you have to step outside of stereotypes. You know when, she, when, when he approached her, she expected him to want nothing to do with her. If you wanna reach people who are far away from God, don't be stereotypical. What do most people who aren't believers expect from us as Christians? Judgment and shame. People are shocked. When you engage someone who's far away from God, they're almost shocked that you're kind. 
They're almost shocked that you don't pronounce them the worst person in the world for having some sin in their life. The first bridge that Jesus built was he stepped outside of those stereotypes. He, he, he broke down those barriers to engage her. The second bridge we see in the conversation is simple. In conversations and in this conversation, seek to create questions. That's verses 10 through 12. Jesus is bringing her along. He's saying things that create curiosity. He, he's creating space in the conversation so she can begin to discover things. Why? Because in conversations like this, it doesn't matter if the people who we're talking to don't believe it and begin to process it on their own. And so Jesus is creating space in the conversation for her to be curious and for her to ask questions. Remember the, the movie E.T.? Remember when Elliot so famously pulled out the Reese's Pieces? And he, what did he do? He, he laid one down there and then he laid one down here and E.T. would pick one up you know, and eat one, and he'd lay another one down, and he would pick, and that happened all the way into, until Elliot got E.T. where he wanted him to be. When I read this text, and I listen to the way that Jesus is engaging this lady, I, I think it's like him dropping little pieces of truth to lead this lady along in the conversation. So what we do, if we're gonna reach outlaws and outcasts, it's simple. We invite questions. We create conversations that allow people to think on their own. The third bridge we see, verses 13 through 15. The third bridge is Jesus and we have to practice patience. We have to practice patience. It's clear, almost frustratingly clear. When you read that, she's just not getting it. I mean, it is whew, right over her head. She's not getting it. When you engage people who are far away from God, can I help you understand something? They're not always going to get it quickly. It's not always going to be easy for them. You have to practice patience. Don't get frustrated, don't get angry, don't, and don't do this. Don't feel like you're a failure because boom, it's not, the, the light's not coming on. The bridge we see here in the conversation is Jesus just stays in it. He stays in it. She's not getting, he stays in it. He practices patience. Don't forget 2 Corinthians chapter four, verse four. It tells us the enemy has blinded their eyes so they do not see the light of the gospel. When you engage outlaws and outcasts, you are dealing with people who are quite frankly blind spiritually. And it's gonna take some time. What's the last bridge we see in this conversation? I like this. Declare truth with hope attached. Declare truth with hope attached. Verses 21 through 24, Jesus begins to share simple, clear, unvarnished, truth. Can I tell you something? There comes a time in conversations and walking beside people where you need to simply say it how it is. And that's great. The church is called to stand up and speak truth. To stand on what? The truth of God's word and declare it unashamedly loud and clear. And there's nothing wrong with that. Unless, unless our truth doesn't have hope attached. Verses 25 through 26, what does Jesus do? He tells her, I am the living water. The one you speak to, that's me. I am. Jesus tells her who he is. That's hope. That's hope. Declare truth with hope attached. Great pastor on our staff. I love him. Passed away just a few years ago. Dr. Deloach. Famous to all of us who have been on this staff. Someone we looked up to and admired so much. 
Every time he would say something, the whole room would go quiet. And he didn't say a whole lot. So when he spoke, you listened. He had been Dr. Young's mentor and friend for decades. Dr. Deloach one time said this. He said, never tell someone about hell without a tear in your eye. Never tell someone about hell without a tear in your eye. When you're speaking truth to somebody, when it comes time in conversation to tell it like it is, don't do it without a broken heart. That broken heart will lead you to do what? Give the hope. The hope that we have. To tell people like it is, but to say, hey, you know what? Here's the good news. God still loves you. He's not done with you. And he loves you so much that he sent his son to die on a cross for you. Declare truth with hope attached. What happened in this conversation? Where did it all lead? Longest conversation recorded in Scripture between Jesus and one person. Look at verse 28. Verse 28. What does it tell us? She left her water pot. You know what that is? Satisfaction. She had found something that satisfied her soul, and she was no longer thirsty. And she ran away and left the water pot right there by the well. And verse 29 tells us what? She went back into the town and began to tell everyone about what had just happened to her. The outcast became an evangelist. Don't you love that? The outcast became an evangelist. Can I tell you something? There are people in your life that need you to begin to speak truth into their life. Outlaws and outcasts. Use this model, put it into practice. Be available for divine appointments. Break down barriers and build bridges. And then last but not least, remember, we sow and God grows. That's it. We sow, God grows. We are in the seed scattering business. Take the pressure off yourself. He's going to bring it all to fruition in the way that only He can, in the time that only He can. We just have to be faithful to scatter seed. I wonder if all those conversations between Billy Graham and Johnny Cash made a difference in his life. I wonder if the, the reverend, the evangelist, the preacher ever really got through to the outlaw. God wants to use you to reach people far away from God. Won't you let him do it? Won't you let him do it? Would you pray with me? Father, I pray for everyone in this room. God, I pray for the people in the room who watched that video just now and, and relate to it so much. In some way, they're experiencing that type of brokenness, that type of emptiness. God, help them know you still love them. Help them know that you sent your son so they could be rescued from the brokenness of this world. I pray for the outlaws and the outcasts in this room. Draw them to you, God. Draw them back to you. 